Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Music Publishing Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Dennis Tavensky, and this week I'm joined by Thomas de Neuville of I Care If You Listen. Hi. Hello. How's it, how's it going? Pretty well, thank you. It's a, it's a rainy Saturday morning here in Ithaca, and we've been uh, wanting rain for so long now, so I'm, I'm actually quite happy to, uh, to, having, to be having like a, a rainy weekend. It's good. Nice. Well, you, you could have had some of the, the rain that we've had lately. It's been <laughs> a lot in, in New York. <laughs> so uh, so uh, tell us a bit about, about you and all the things you do um, at, to, so that, you know, anyone who doesn't know you, uh, they, they should know you. And... Oh, thank you. Well, my name is Thomas de Neville. I was born in France, which explains the accent. <laughs> um, I've been in the U.S. for about 10 years now. I came to study. Um, I have a background in engineering, mostly mechanical engineering. And, but I came to the U.S. to study voice at the time. I had studied voice in France and in Italy. And I decided to move to the U.S. to get a degree. Um, then I just realized that voice was not for me, so I mm -hmm. stopped. <laughs> and um, went back to composition. I had been writing music for a long time. And so I went back to composition and got a combined BAMA in composition at Hunter College. So, um, so that's kind of my, my background. And um, as I was working on my master's thesis, um, I decided to blog about my experience. It was a way for me to document my work and also kind of stay on schedule. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided to do that. And um, pretty much only my mom was reading it, which is fine. And, uh, and after that, when I was done with my thesis, I was like, oh, maybe I can start reviewing concerts and CDs on my blog, um, which was something that I had started doing a couple of years uh, before uh, for a French um, outlet, for a French speaking outlet called ClassicInfo.com. I think it's based in Belgium. So I was the, their New York City kind of new music um, correspondent. And I was writing about concerts and, and CDs for them. So I was like, well, I've been doing that. I've got a little bit of experience. Maybe I can try doing it in English, which I did. And uh, after a few weeks, somebody was like, hey, can I write on your blog? And I had never thought about that. And I said, <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah, absolutely. And then more people came. And I felt less and less comfortable with the idea of um, having people write on my personal blog. Mm -hmm. So I came up with a name. Actually, the name was already there. Um, my personal blog had a name on my personal site. But I decided to buy a .com mm -hmm. and spin a WordPress instance somewhere else. And then I care if you was born. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I care if you listen. This has been going for for how many years now? Uh, we're going towards. Uh, it's going to be six years at the end of the year. That's six great. years in December. Yeah. That's great, and it's it's grown quite a bit. Uh, you have uh, you said a, a core of five people that. We have a core team of five people. Uh, I'm going to name them because I'm very very thankful for their work. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Rising, who is our operations coordinator, has been with me for years now from the very beginning. Nice. Um, we also have um, Amanda Cook, who is the associate editor, doing a fantastic job. Another fantastic job is being done by Martha Cargo. And uh, we have a new member. Martha Cargo is in charge of social media. She mm -hmm. does fantastic things on, on Facebook and Twitter. Nice. And um, we have also Caitlin Pretorius, who recently joined. And he, she's going to be a community manager, but I'm more of an internal community manager. Mm -hmm. And then on the contribu contributor side, we're about we have about um, close to a hundred contributors, nice. present and past. So some of them were just guest contributors, some of them just you know came and went, and which is totally fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but I think I registered the hundredth contributor a couple of weeks ago. Oh. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 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 the um, the 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 site is is uh, mostly reviews and and talking about CD reviews and, and, and concert reviews. I know that there's an entrepreneurship uh, section. Uh, yeah. What all do you guys cover? Um, so I had to draw the line in terms of, of the music we cover. I had to draw the line and I drew the line towards the late 60s. So people who pitch us bar talk and I'm like, I'm sorry, just, we can't just cover that. So, mm -hmm. so we start at the late 60s basically and um, we do concert reviews, CD reviews, interviews and as you mentioned we have uh, an entrepreneurship series that is led by Astrid Baumgartner who's a fantastic consultant and I'm so mm -hmm. thankful that you know she's she's writing with us um, 
And then uh, I also curate uh, a seasonal mixtape. So four times a year, yeah. people can come to the website and download a free mixtape. So so that's that's nice. It's it's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And I think people people like it. Um, the latest mixtape, um, yeah, which is um, closed, was the spring one. The spring was was downloaded about eight hundred and fifty times. Uh, which, if you if you were to compare this to a, a new music CD, you know, album sales would be like a really really good uh, release. That would be a very successful release. So so I'm glad to be mm -hmm. getting these numbers. Um, we don't charge anything, of course, and uh, we try as much as possible to. Uh, put the artist forward, and um, mm -hmm. so uh, so we tweet. You know, if you follow us on Twitter, we just tweet constantly to you know um, to engage people with with that, and um, yes, and introduce the artists that are featured. So that's 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 what we do. Um, nice. We had a magazine that um, I had to stop a year ago, so we released mm -hmm. twelve issues. Uh, these were bi-monthly issues, and um, that was a different kind of work. Uh, it was more in depth, uh, slightly long form, slightly longer form, and uh, exclusively on iOS devices and Android devices. Um, and that was a different kind of work, and, and I really enjoyed it. But it was just not, just not possible with the, the, the niche audience that we have. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, a lot, a, a lot of work, and, and maybe the, ultimately the, the return just didn't. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. And um, it's, you know, working on the magazine is a very different vibe. Like if, yeah. um, if you have um, a volunteer contributor who uh, decided to review a CD and, and the person cannot make the date that we had agreed upon for the publication, it's fine. We can push a week or two, you know, mm -hmm. we want this to be fun for everybody. So it's fine. But when you have a magazine with a street date, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of June 1st, like everything needs to be ready. <laughs> At least a few days before, and yeah. I was, you know, I was coding and formatting all the articles and copy editing and proofreading, and I was not doing a great job at that, of course. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's it's a very different beast, and um, and just the nature of the deadlines made it very very hard. And um, so, yeah, well, I, what I really loved about it was was the variety, and um, you know, we talked about tech, we talked about. I always try to feature ensembles and look at more of more of some of the history. Um, one of the articles that I commissioned that I was really proud of was uh, an article on the on Group 180, mm -hmm. who is who was uh, I think a Hungarian, if I remember correctly, a new music ensemble in the 80s. And I've always been fascinated by those guys because they were like playing Zebski and Steve Reich, you know, mm -hmm. back in the 80s. Uh, in Hungary, and I was like, "How did you guys get into that music? And how did you even find that music back then? You know, and, and perform it?" So, so uh, we were able to be in touch with um, former ensemble members and interview them, and I'm, I'm I'm really proud of that. That was that was a really fun piece, and um, and also working with a photographer. Most of the covers were done by my friend Axel Dupeux, who's a French photographer in New York City, and. Uh, and it was just a blast to be working with him, you know, preparing mm -hmm. the shoot, or I was like his assistant on the shoot and connecting with ensembles and composers, you know, libertists also. So that was that was really fun. I really liked this, um, the physicality of the photo shoot, which is not something that we really do on like, if you listen on the blog, because you get press um, press shots from publicists or ensembles. So there's, there's no, there's, this kind of logistics just don't exist on the blog. Yeah, so. yeah. Um. It doesn't the, the the time and effort doesn't make make sense to for uh, for something that that's so such a, a a fast and easy way of getting information out there less it, that's uh, less intensive. Definitely. Um, so the the range of your contributors is, is, is um, probably pretty wide for for the the blog, right? Uh, what do you mean by range? Uh, in terms of um, composers, performers, just uh, new music of aficionados and. and it's the the names that I've seen. It seems like it, it. It's you don't have to be one particular type of person to to contribute. To no, 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 no. I mean, we are open to you know we're kind of profile or background agnostic as long as you have something interesting to say and you're mm -hmm. able to express it correctly and you know like and eloquently and we're fine. We were happy to work with people. So, but but uh, you're right. It's absolutely absolutely correct. We have um, composers. We have performers. We have. Um, 
um, ensemble members, we have scholars, you know, we have people who are doing their PhDs and stuff and mm. and they, they are ready to spend some time writing articles and reviews. So I love the mix. I, I really love the mix of, of people that, that write for us. And um, but I think we're able to keep a pretty high standard and mm -hmm. um, in terms of, of, of reading experience. And uh, this is also due to Amanda Cook, who is doing a fantastic job. Um, working with the writers and editing and advising them. So I think she's really becoming like very, very good at that. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, a very wide spectrum of, of profiles. But in the end, I feel that there's a unified, strong voice. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm really happy with that. Nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and just to, to touch on the mixtape uh, again, I was, I was actually just thinking about the, the mixtapes uh, this week, and uh, I, I, I like I, I think that's a great thing. How, how do you, how do you get the? Um, it, it's wonderful for the composer for the composers. It's wonderful for the the performers. Um, how how do you how do you curate those? How do you put those together? And and um, you know where do the do some of these tracks come from? Um, albums? Do they are they? Yeah, most of them come. From, most of them come from albums, but um, <clears throat> um, we just open a call for submissions. Uh, usually, I would say four to six weeks before uh, the schedule uh, launch date, and then I um, have an, um, a nice form online, and people can fill all the information and upload the album cover or the the art that they want associated with their track yes. and the track itself. Um, so I get about maybe between 60 and 80 submissions uh, for every mixtape. And um, it's very broad. It's mm -hmm. very um, eclectic. Um, and sometimes I get I get hip hop, I get, you know, punk, I get lots of stuff. So I have to filter some stuff, not because it's not good, but just because but it's not it's not really what we're trying to showcase um, yeah. through that medium. And then um, I listen to every piece, of course. <laughs> <laughs> And then, um, and then, as I listen to all the pieces, um, like a mix start to, starts to emerge in my head. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, a piece will echo with another one. I'll be like, "Oh, this track goes really well with this one in succession." Mm -hmm. Or you know, like I like the contrast, or I like the continuity. And um, so, so some some contours start to form in my head just by listening to the tracks. And then I just organize them, and I and I just test my assumptions basically, and uh, and see if it works or if it doesn't. Um, I try to keep the mixtapes between twin and tell that sorry ten and maybe fourteen tracks total cool. um, for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. including the download size. You know, you don't mm -hmm. want to offer something that's two hundred megabytes, even <laughs> yeah. though it's not too much of an issue these days. But um, still, um, but really create something coherent and, and something that's a nice balance. Um, so what I what I say consistently to when I when I you know I send an email to everybody those who have been accepted and those who haven't. Mm -hmm. And in the email that I sent to those who haven't been accepted, I'm, I'm just saying that, uh, you know, please resubmit because mm -hmm. there is no, there's no formula, there's no rule. It's just that the stuff that I've picked works really well together. Mm -hmm. And the piece that you've sent might work really well in a later mixtape, you know. Yeah. Uh, we try to accept and feature content that is maybe a year old at most, you know, mm -hmm. to try to try to keep it fresh. Mm -hmm. But if something wasn't picked in the in the in the winter one, please submit it for the spring or the summer one and that might work, you know. It's yeah. just it's um yeah, yeah, it's just it's it's like a recipe, you know, it's like an, an improvised recipe. Mm -hmm. Nice. But um what I like about the mixtape is that it enables us to showcase music that we wouldn't showcase necessarily through the blog. Mm -hmm. So I like to put some folk and maybe some pop and something that I more on, on on the jazz end of things of mm -hmm. the spectrum, and um, I'm I'm comfortable sharing that, and I think people uh, appreciate this variety. This yeah. you know, um, but that's not necessarily something that we would review. We wouldn't go to a you know indie folk concert and review that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, nice, <laughs> nice. Uh, so with, you do have a pretty pretty active social media presence uh, with with the site. How, yeah. How, how do you um, how do you make all of that work together? What's your your philosophy on on, on that? Um, and and does that does that bring in a lot of readers? And oh, sorry, the cats are playing. <laughs> uh, and does does it, does it seem to foster a really good sense of community around around the site and around the material? 
Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, we get a lot of traffic from Facebook and Twitter, um, and um, and there is there is a sense of community. There is a sense of tone, and and, and I have to thank Martha Cargo for this, um, and and that and that works pretty well. Um, it's not it's not the community that I would envision yet, mm -hmm. um, but that would take a lot more work. Mm -hmm. But I, what I really love about what Martha is doing and what I've encouraged Martha to do in, you know, when she started working with us is really be very inclusive and, mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and curious at the same time. So, and, and maybe we'll talk about this later when we talk about social media for, uh, for composers, ensembles, etc. But um, something that's really key is that you, sh you shouldn't just talk about yourself. Mm -hmm. And and that's something I think that we do very well at IQ if you listen. Mm -hmm. You know, if there is something that is really awesome on Q2 or New Music Box, we'll be the first ones to push in and say, read that stuff, this is really good, you know, or The Guardian and stuff like that. So so um if you, if you look at our Twitter feed, for instance, on the Facebook feed, maybe one out of four or five or six posts is really about us and the rest is about new music and stuff mm -hmm. that that's really interesting to the community so i'm very satisfied with that you know uh, martha is doing a fantastic job and um, and i think we have really engaging feeds really engaging uh, communities but um we grew up pretty fast i think we're about seventy three thousand on twitter wow. um something around five or six k on facebook and then two thousand on instagram and then there are other networks that are kind of like forgotten by now I, you know I used to take care of the Tumblr one but uh, mm -hmm. I just now consume content I don't really push anything to Tumblr and or Google yeah. plus but um, yeah, it's mostly Facebook Twitter and Instagram nice. yeah so um, yeah that's that's a fantastic way to push our content but also connect with the community and share very interesting things give shout outs for the mixtape you know as I said the goal is to get people to download it but also uh, feature artists and mention them so every day we'll tweet multiple times about the mixtape and and mention the, the artist, yeah. Nice. You said you have, have a, a, a vision for the community uh, that you haven't quite reached. What 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 is that that vision? And and well, I mean, it's just the the, the level of interaction. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a wonderful curated stream mm -hmm. on social media, so it's it's very engaging, and it's really not all about us. So that's that was one of my goals, and I think we're achieving this. But then. Um, I don't think that we have the bandwidth to really engage in conversation, you know, mm -hmm. and and, um, and sometimes we post articles that are kind of um, controversial, mm -hmm. which is fine. And um, but we don't necessarily follow up on that or engage with the community on that because we we don't have that much time. Mm -hmm. You know, it already takes a lot of time to curate something interesting mm -hmm. every single day, mm -hmm. and um, and then on top of that, engaging and responding, and you know, so that's. That that's that's tricky. I'm not sure we'll ever get there because again, it's a it's a bandwidth issue. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bandwidth issue. If we were all working 24/7 on care if you listen, it would be a very very different thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but we're not, and uh, so that's you know that's one of the things that I, you, you you know, you have to pick your battles, and and I'm very very happy with the quality of our social media presence, and even if we don't engage as much as I would like, that's fine. I think we're already doing a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that that leads us nicely into into social media in general. Uh, so you you do a lot of uh, consulting and speaking on on this uh, and and other sort of related uh, issues like email marketing and and uh, designing websites. So um, I think you know I have so, some some friends who want to do more on social media, but they uh, they kind of don't know what to do and I found myself in a position uh, where I've I've scaled back and I kind of want to get back into things and what what are you, what are your general thoughts on on how a composer can can handle that and, uh, and be be more active without feeling like that's where all your time is going yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I, I, I always encourage people uh, to define their goals very early on mm -hmm. okay you're gonna step into social media, you're going to decide to be present on social. It's great. Okay. Why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. What are you expecting? And how can you quantify that? How can you measure your success? How can you tell a year from now 
well, that was good. You know, I decided to be on Twitter mm -hmm. and this is my growth month to month and, and that was good. And, you know, this is what I got. I got commissions, whatever. Like, how are you going to measure your success? So you have to be very pragmatic and realistic about that. Um, I think the, any network in any, any channel on social is, is fun and engaging and you can get really trapped into the technicalities of the network and trying to hack things mm -hmm. and, it's really fun. And so you end up spending a lot of time and, uh, and maybe you don't get much in return. So, uh, and as composers, you know, you want to spend as much time, much time as possible writing music or, yeah. you know, really working on your music. So, so that's why that's the first thing that I tell people, just define your goals mm -hmm. and make sure they're very, um, um, very, very clearly defined. Um, I often refer to uh, Astrid's article that we've published on Accurate If You Listen, um, and she talks about defining smart goals. Uh, I encourage you to go and read this article. It's, it's really well done. So that's the first step. Uh, and once you've thought about your goal uh, or goals, you need to think about your audience. Mm -hmm. And um, I know it's tricky because sometimes when you start, you don't really have an audience. So mm -hmm. you don't really know who your audience is. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's say you already have a website and you all decided to step into social. Well, look at your stats on, on, on your website. Um, if you have Google Analytics um, implemented on your website, mm -hmm. which is free, and if you have the right settings turned on, you can get some demographics data. You can know, you know what, what the age of your visitor uh, is or you know, the, the, the location and things like that. Mm -hmm. If uh, because of the nature of your music, most of your visitors uh, come from China. Um, maybe Facebook is not a good network for you because <laughs> people cannot access the network. Maybe putting videos on YouTube is not a good idea because they cannot access YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's that's what you know. It, it's it's an extreme example, but but still, try to think about your audience. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know, make assumptions, and um, try to maybe. <clears throat> look at somebody else's presence mm -hmm. and say, my music is very close to this person's music, or I would really love to achieve the level of success of this person, and I think that we're kind of close aesthetically speaking. Mm -hmm. So just take a moment and look at their social media presence and look at their followers. It's very easy on Twitter, for instance, to click on followers and look mm -hmm. at who's, who follows them. Um, try to get an idea of that, because that will help you also define which channel you should be on. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe the right audience for you will call for a presence on Snapchat. Mm -hmm. Maybe it will be Twitter. Maybe it will be Google+. Plus. So, so that will help you decide that. Um, and then the, the third uh, recommendation that I usually make is, uh, and, and the assumption that, that I'm trying to, to break is, you don't have to be on social 24-7. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like it, but it's really not the case. Mm -hmm. And um, so you basically have to mix um, it's it's a mixed model it's like uh, asynchronous and, and like mm -hmm. real-time model basically mm -hmm. you need to rely on tools that will enable you to schedule content uh, a lot of what we do on social a lot of what a social presence is is curating mm -hmm. um, that brings us back to what I said earlier about I care if you listen's presence it's not about talking about yourself all the time mm -hmm. You don't want to be that person. You don't want to be that person at a cocktail party who just talks about themselves because mm -hmm. nobody wants to talk to that person. <laughs> <clears throat> and a way to do this is to um, follow a ratio. And a ratio that I often uh, mention is the 411 ratio, where you're going to share four things, uh, four pieces of content that are, have been created by somebody else. Mm -hmm. You're going to reshare something once. That's the number one. And then you're going to have a one self serving tweet. So 4 one, one. And you have to see this uh, ratio as a cycle. Mm -hmm. So once every six tweets, you can share something about an upcoming concert, mm -hmm. about your album on Basecamp, on Bandcamp, something like that. So, um, but by following this ratio, you make sure that you have something to say that is interesting and not about yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you, think, if you think about it, you can schedule a lot of that. So a lot of that can be asynchronous. Um, I personally recommend a tool like Buffer, mm -hmm. uh, which is really, I think, a standard in the industry right now. And um, so what I usually recommend is you wake up in the morning or maybe late at night, you start buffering, you start scheduling um, 
your tweet for the day after. So mm -hmm. let's say you tweet six times a day, which fits nicely with our 411 ratio. Mm -hmm. um, you are going to schedule those four pieces of content that were created by somebody else, for instance. Mm -hmm. And um, you can source that through RSS feeds. Mm -hmm. um, a big aspect of social media presence is also recognizing influencers, mm -hmm. uh, people that you, you know, whose content you love and whose content you want to reshare or whose content your audience might connect with. Mm -hmm. So as, as a composer of new music, for instance, um, New Music Box might be one of these, Q2 mm -hmm. might be one of these, mm -hmm. I Care If You Listen might be one of these. Yeah. So Buffer, and, and I'm not making any money by saying that, but Buffer uh, lets you um, integrate RSS feeds. So it's very easy when you have your Buffer set up to just go through your list of uh, articles that are pulled mm -hmm. dynamically from those RSS feeds. Mm -hmm. And in a few clicks, you can read the article and publish it in your queue, push it in your queue. Um, so anyway, I won't go more into details, but you, you get the point. Yeah. Um, social media is about mixing the schedule and the life. So you can be in front of your, you know, tweet deck uh, dashboard, mm -hmm. maybe three, four times a, a day for like 10 minutes, maybe less than that, maybe two times a day for 10 minutes or mm -hmm. once for 10 minutes and one for 10 minutes on your cell phone while you're commuting on, you know, on the train or the bus, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, to kind of re 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 reply to the mentions or thank people for the retweets or follow mm. more people, et cetera, et cetera. But you know that throughout your day, Buffer will post stuff for you on your behalf mm -hmm. and stuff that you've curated and that provides value for your audience. Nice. Sorry, and that was very long, but that's that, that's kind yeah. of like the three big steps when I when people want to start a social media presence. Nice, yeah, and uh, I find myself, uh, when, I, when I do, when I start to think about uh, scheduling content um i tend to use hootsuite that mm -hmm. uh that works quite well um is, is buffer a paid thing or is are they a free service i think there's a free plan but i i've been using the the what they call the awesome plan which is like nine dollars a month and it's the best the best nine dollars a month i've ever spent it's nice. it's incredible it's incredible and the tool is always being um tweaked and um Perfected, and they have a fantastic iOS app, so it works really well for me. Nice. Um, they also <clears throat> they also uh, integrate very nicely with Bitly. Okay, yeah. And I happen to have two uh, shortened vanity URLs set up. Mm -hmm. So if you look at my personal Twitter feed, you'll notice that all the links that I share start with tdn tdnvl.me, mm -hmm. and we also have a short. Uh, URL, vanity URL, like that. Also for IK, if you listen, so so th that was a perfect match for for us. Like it's just it's a bonus for free, so nice. buffer makes sense. But Hootsuite works well. Uh, I was using Hootsuite um, maybe two three years ago for IK, if you listen, and it worked really well. Mm -hmm. I just felt that the the user interface was not evol evolving as fast as yeah. um, other competitors were. Uh, so I felt that I had to move to move on. But um, it's it's a very strong product too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a, a especially for you know, for people who aren't really ready to spend money. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a, a great option. Um, I want to go back a little bit to your your first point of of setting goals for for social media. What what's sort of a typical goal that people can think about um, with that? Is there um, so you you can you can look at um, both ends of the pipe if you wish. Mm -hmm. Um, you can define a goal in terms of, of uh, following. Mm -hmm. um, so you can say, I want to triple my following within a year. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a nice goal to achieve. And then we can talk about methods and techniques to do that. But then you can also look at the other end of the pipe and say, I want to see an increase in traffic from Twitter, mm -hmm. maybe a 20% increase year over year on my website coming from Twitter. And mm -hmm. that's very easy to do on Google Analytics. So I like to see both ends because it can be very easy to get trapped in the number game on Twitter and be like, mm -hmm. yay, I broke 500, whatever. Yeah. But um, if it doesn't translate in traffic coming from that channel, and you can assume that if it's coming from that channel through what you're pushing, you know, that you're doing a great job. So if you don't connect to the to really the, the, the goal in terms of traffic on your website, then it, it, it doesn't really make any sense. I mean, it's going to be like just a vanity number uh, that doesn't really um, translate into like your business goal. So mm -hmm. so I think that's 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 a way I would present that. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it, it's very, very easy to get get say, oh, I, I have 
a thousand followers now, or I have 1500 followers. That's great. I want more followers. And, and, and yeah, it become that becomes an end in and of itself rather than mm-hmm. the, the means to an end of engaging with more people and, um, and getting more traffic to the places where you really want it and need it mm-hmm. in order to, I think the idea of reach is more interesting than the idea of number of followers. Mm-hmm. And, and by reach is basically the, the, the amount of eyeballs that see your content. So, you know, if you have 100 followers and and you tweet and maybe 10% of your following will actually see that, mm-hmm. okay, you have, you know, like a 10 followers reach. But um, if you start publishing content, pushing content that is interesting and engaging, mm-hmm. people might start retweeting it and, mm-hmm. and the idea of resharing mm-hmm. just, just multiplies your reach. And uh, Facebook and Twitter make tools available for free for you to kind of track that reach. And I think that's probably a better metric. Mm-hmm. Um, because yes, number of followers is great, but um, it's not that hard to get more followers. There are some techniques for that, and it yeah. doesn't really mean anything. Mm-hmm. But really, the, the amount of engagement on your content and and your updates will show in the will show in the reach. So that's that's probably a better metric to track. Um, yeah, there there are others, but uh, but the idea of reach is important. Um, it's also important in the context of Facebook, where we see a decreasing organic reach. Mm-hmm. So that's something that I also mentioned a lot. Um, you know, maybe four or five years ago, the organic reach of your post was maybe about 15%, or so that's what we used to see on like, if you listen. And now it's probably going down to like 2 or 3%. And, um, and by that, I mean that organic reach means the number of eyeballs you get on a given um, update, a given post, without paying anything. Mm-hmm. And um, what we're seeing is that Facebook is slowly but surely tweaking the algorithm to display less and less posts into people's feeds, which makes total sense. You know, you, mm-hmm. you, you can physically not see everything that everybody posts mm-hmm. the, way, the way it works on Twitter. So you cannot on Facebook. And um, so they're basically doing this to, to, to push people to pay for uh, their posts. And uh, that should also be taken taken into consideration when people look into creating uh, Facebook pages, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, The the, the thing that I say, and if you have money and if you're ready to see Facebook as a pay-per-click channel, Mm -hmm. then it's fine. Then it's totally fine. If you're ready to make some advertising and target your post and pay for that, Facebook is a fantastic platform, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the advertising capabilities and the granularity, like, if you think about it, ever since, ever since Facebook has started, we've happily told them everything about ourselves. Mm-hmm. So now they know, and uh, you can segment your audience by zip code, by number of kids, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a fantastic advertising um, platform. Mm-hmm. So if you're ready to pay for it, it's great. If you're not ready to pay for it, consider, you know, think twice about mm-hmm. having a Facebook page. That might be a bit um, disappointing. Yeah, you, you, and you're talking about having a page as opposed to just your regular profile. Profile, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. <clears throat> Some people, I mean, I don't think that's a mistake that people are making right now, but it's a, mm-hmm. it's a mistake that people were making a few years ago where they were like, I'm not going to start a page, I'm just going to use my personal profile. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're, if you're getting really successful, Facebook will, will limit your number of friends to 5,000, and mm-hmm. there are some things that you cannot technically do with a personal profile that you can do with a page. Mm-hmm. Um, namely uh, promoting posts, you know, pushing posts and don't get a lot of data. And also if they realize that you're doing quote unquote business with your personal profile, they can also shut you down. Mm. So, so it's not, it's not a good idea. You know, if you're really doing this for business, you should have a page. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I, uh, I recently um, attempted to do um, a Facebook ad for my album. Mm-hmm. It was the, I tried the, the week, uh, the week of pride in New York and, uh, had a, had a hell of a time with it. (laughs) Setting it up was, was pretty easy. Um, but I just ran into various snags and, um, because the, the cover of the album happens to be two men holding hands and, you know, they're, they're, Mm -hmm. they're in a bed and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a classy picture. It's, it's not as racy as it might sound. Um, but it, the, it got, flagged and my my account my ad account got suspended wow somebody and and i don't know why and it took a week so that in the middle of all this the the ad went down 
And all I got was this frankly bitchy email that uh, said, you've been flagged and so you're shut down. Uh, if you think that this is done an error, you can report here, but otherwise you're done. And I couldn't get an answer as to what, okay, what was it? What did I violate? What, you know, is it, cause I tweaked the hell out of this, this picture mm -hmm. to make it, mm -hmm. I, I had to bring it down. So all you see is like basically the, 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 hand, the fingers intertwined and, um, you know, try to, I, I, I went to their page and reported a couple of times like, Hey, can I get a response here? You know, tell, tell me what's wrong and I'll fix it. I'm happy to fix it. Or if this was done in error, can it, can, can it be, um, addressed? It took over a week and they finally said, okay, you're back up. That was it. I'm like, thanks Facebook. You're so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah don't get me started uh, yeah <laughs> if you put this in, in into perspective with uh the amount of gun sales that happen on facebook every day oh yeah <laughs> anyway so yeah. end of the argument <laughs> yeah yeah i they originally i had had a back and forth before uh the, the thing got shut down um saying oh you can't have any sort of sexual i you know thing even if you're even if you're giving away free condoms for uh you know hiv prevention uh, you can't actually show the condom wrapper i was like great that's so helpful thanks for that you're gonna have to use a metaphor you know you're gonna have to show a lot of umbrellas yeah yeah a lot a lot of balloons lying around balloons, yeah. <laughs> um yeah. I, another thing with the that I think some people get a little hung up on or they get a little scared of is, um, or overwhelmed by, uh, I know a friend of mine, he would say, okay, now, now I have to join Twitter, uh, Tumblr. What's that? Why do I, now I have to join that. Like, I, I, I think some people do think that they have to join everything to try and go out after the, the most people possible, but uh, that has never seemed right to me that it seems like you should be much more much more targeted and, and think about who's on those platforms absolutely and and is your audience on this platform mm -hmm. you yeah. know that that's the thing yeah that's also why i'm not sure that tumblr is a good um social network for us i was just gonna say tumblr kind of doesn't you know i personally love it i love tumblr you know i spend yeah. some time on it and i just you know it, it's cool you know i like snapchat it's fun but um we're not going to be on those that much, yeah. you know. So, so you don't have to be on everything, mm -hmm. uh, which is a mistake that that I've made when I launched mm -hmm. Hacker Hercules, and I was like, oh, I'm going to have a presence on everything. No, mm -hmm. because you're going to end up having a lame presence on everything, mm -hmm. and you should focus your efforts on maybe one to two networks, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, maybe try to find networks that are um, complementary, or you know, for instance, Twitter and Instagram. You can technically share photos on Twitter, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe you want to keep your photos on Instagram and maybe it's easier to share photos on Instagram mm -hmm. and, and have filters and stuff like that. And, and because you're in a community, you know, you're in a, in a network where that, that's the expectation, that's the medium, you know, you're going to share photos and videos. And so people come here to consume that. So, um, so that's a nice way to do it. So yeah, I would I would just limit my efforts to one to maybe three networks mm -hmm. that work well in tandem, and kind of represent what you're offering. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sh show a different perspective on what you're offering. Basically, um, another mistake that I see a lot is people are like, oh, you know what? I'm going to create my Twitter account, Facebook, and Instagram, and connect all of them together. So when I Facebook something, it's posted on everything automatically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the most terrible thing you could do <laughs> uh, because, you know, because if people follow you on those three channels, they're going to see the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, some platforms don't share stuff nicely natively. So mm -hmm. what I'm saying by this is if you post a photo on Instagram and you say, hey, I'm going to connect my Twitter account, so I'm going to share it directly on Twitter. Well, Twitter and Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, are not really good friends. Mm -hmm. So they are not going to help each other, meaning that if you post a photo natively from Instagram to Twitter, 
it's not going to show as an image in your Twitter feed. You're mm -hmm. going to have to click on the Instagram link and go and open Instagram and look at the photo. Mm -hmm. And of course, they do this, do this on purpose. So you're, you're, not really, you're not making it very easy for people to kind of engage with your content by doing so. And then it, sound, it feels very robotic and not very mm -hmm. tailored. You know, um, every platform, every channel has kind of an etiquette and a way to communicate on that mm -hmm. platform. And, um, and that, that's, that's a terrible idea. It means that it represents more work. You, know? mm -hmm. you have to think more about how you present yourself on those different channels. But uh, I think that's the right way to do it. And, and it brings us back to the beginning of that conversation, meaning that since every network requires a different way to address audiences, mm -hmm. make sure that you pick the right ones and mm -hmm. make sure that you don't pick too many of those networks because there's a learning curve for mm -hmm. each of them and you're going to be overwhelmed very fast and you're going to be disappointed and just give up really fast if you don't if you don't build you know this this knowledge of the networks yeah yeah it, and um I, one thing that that has that always bothers me about connecting accounts is, is the idea of is that cross posting okay like i saw this on facebook now i see it on twitter and it's on instagram it it's it's all of these places and i i'm being bombarded like i hey dude i like you but i've now seen the same thing three times and it, 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 it can be, anno it, it, it's the same thing that I see uh, some people, they have their, their personal Facebook profile and they have their professional Facebook page and the same exact thing gets posted to both. And fortunately now that kind of gets condensed into one thing um, that it's, it's not quite so obnoxious as it used to be, but it still is annoying. And I, I know that I'm doing it right now with, uh, to, to some degree with, with my personal profile and, and the podcast page just to get a, a, a broader reach kind of reposting to to my personal thing but and I, and I can see how you know tempting that is I have friends also who have personal pages you know profiles and also pages and when you're an artist there's really no there's no line you know what I mean it's just if you have 1200 friends on Facebook and you have you know 200 followers on your page mm-hmm you don't want to miss on that audience, you know, yeah. you're like, oh my God, it's like I've got six times more followers on my personal profile. Let me mm -hmm. just share that too. But, um, but you have, I think there's, there's, there's a way to do it and everyone has to find their own way. But, um, mm -hmm. but mirroring post is certainly not the way to do it. Yeah. It's, uh, or it's at least not the way that I like to, I like to see it. You know, I feel, yeah, yeah it's just, it doesn't feel very, very special. And that's, you know, it's all about angles and how you present stuff to your external audience and your internal audience, basically. Mm -hmm. So you have to do a little bit more work to, to find an engaging way to present that to both. So, yeah, but I agree with that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, yeah I, I hate seeing it and I feel weird doing it. It just, it feels <laughs> kind of icky. <laughs> um, what, uh, is there anything more you want to talk about with, with social media stuff before we, we move on a little bit to... Um, to email no things. i've got um i've got an ebook in the works about oh. um twitter nice uh where i'll be sharing a lot of tips and a lot of uh, tools and um i'll be talking about ratio and stuff like that and influencers and um i think yeah yeah it's gonna be like 12 chapters it's not gonna be a big thing but um mm -hmm. I, I i just want to put it out there so um yeah. it's coming it's coming soon cool do you have a, <laughs> a, a date for that that we can look for it or okay nope well Cool. Nope. Well, then, uh, <laughs> then keep me posted, and I'll make sure to, to get that sure. out to, to everybody here. Sounds uh, good. So one thing that I've been I, I, I think about a lot, one thing that I've actually been talking about with uh, a couple of other podcasters that I've connected with is uh, your email list and making use of that. And we, we talked a little bit. I, I right now only have two two subscribers to the music publishing podcast oh, email everybody list. Everybody should subscribe. Come on, yeah, people, subscribe. Yeah, I'm. It, um, I'll, I'll I'll tell I'll tell my plans here. So if you if, if you do join the, the the podcast mailing list, I'm going to start putting out some uh, some things that uh, you'll only get through uh, through the list. Extra um, I think extra little interviews with some of the guests and uh, you know short things and and um, there's another another project in the works that is going to dovetail nicely you'll get some some stuff way early with that so uh so sign up on the website um so what are, what are your thoughts on on mailing lists and and how how important they are for 
That's a, that's a very leading question. How important <laughs> is it? <laughs> so let me, <clears throat> let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, if you're old enough, you remember MySpace. Mm -hmm. And if you're old enough, remember how people were gung-ho about like building their presence on MySpace. And I was jealous of my friends who had like 4,000 followers on MySpace and that was mm -hmm. great, et cetera. So, so remember that, remember the amount of time and effort that you spent building that, mm -hmm. okay? And where is MySpace now? Mm -hmm. What has happened to MySpace? What has happened to this audience? What has happened to the amount of time that you spent building that, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, what has happened to MySpace is probably less likely to happen to Facebook, Twitter, and other networks, but still, stuff can happen. What I'm trying to say here is that on social, you do not own your audience and don't, you know, don't take on the wrong way, but, but you have people who decided to follow you and look at what you're doing through a medium that you absolutely don't control. Mm -hmm. If tomorrow Twitter says, it's gonna be 20 bucks a month to be on Twitter now, you have zero control over this. Yeah. Okay. So. This is why you should build your email list as soon as possible, because it's, it's the only asset that you own. Mm -hmm. It's the place where people have to opt in and sometimes opt in twice. We have a double opt in. So people, people have to opt in to be on it. So there is, there is a very, very strong intent uh, on behalf of those followers. Like, yes, I want you to send stuff to my inbox, which is already cluttered with spam and stuff that I don't want, but still, mm -hmm. I want you to have a place in my inbox. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a very strong intent. And um, <clears throat> and whatever happens to social medias, social channels, you will keep that. This is yours, you know? Mm -hmm. If you don't abuse it, if you follow the, the, the laws in your, mm -hmm. in your country, uh, this is yours, you know? <clears throat> so it's, it, it's very important for this reason. Also, if you look at it, email is is really a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also a mistake that, that people make sometimes is that, oh, I'm going to send an email blast. And just the mm -hmm. word blast is mm -hmm. like, take that. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's not, it's not a great way to, to look at it. So I wouldn't use the word blast anymore. Um, but it's a true one-on-one -on -one conversation because you're going to send an email to somebody who gave you access to the to their very personal inbox and inbox mm -hmm. is very personal okay mm -hmm. what i love about email is that there is not this bs social pressure mm -hmm. you know this kind of patterns that you see on facebook where you know the girlfriend will post on the boy's friends wall publicly oh we've been five years together you're the best i love you i don't need to see that yeah like yeah. it's you know it's beautiful i'm happy for you guys but i don't need to see that that's kind of <laughs> that's a byproduct that's 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 a weird pattern that comes from the nature itself of, of the network and we don't see that on facebook on, on on email marketing meaning that the conversation you're having with the person you're emailing is very personal and and, and there is no external pressure it's just mm -hmm. it's just you and the person um um, data and research also shows that email has a stronger conversion rate than uh, social. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning that if you're pushing for something, if you're selling something, an album, concert tickets, you might have some success on social media, you'll have a stronger, a better success on mm -hmm. email marketing, okay? Because by now people are used to receiving uh, commercial emails. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a design language in place for that and um, and again, there's a level of trust. If I let you come into my inbox, I trust what you're saying. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. if I engage constantly with your content through email, like there's there's a relationship that's being built that is probably stronger than than it would be on social. So, so, so that's my point. And then, if you build your list uh, well, and mm -hmm. if you maintain it well, you also have uh, segmenting capabilities that you won't necessarily have on uh, on social unless you pay for it. We mm -hmm. talked about Facebook earlier and how you can really segment uh, in a very granular way uh, what you're pushing uh, mm -hmm. at a cost. Um, in email, you can do this for free, basically, mm -hmm. or for the amount of, that, you, that you spend a month you know, on, on your email marketing system. So um, even if I see web, social, and email as an ecosystem, and everybody, you know, each element relies on the other, Mm -hmm. For me, email is extremely important, extremely, mm -hmm. extremely important. Um, so yes, build your list, uh, mm -hmm. maintain it, um, respect your readers, um, 
don't send everything to everybody mm -hmm. uh, because it might not be relevant. Mm -hmm. Uh, so anyway, I mean, I could spend for a, an hour and a half on, on, on email marketing, but yes, I'm very adamant about that. Uh, there are some great tools out there. I always recommend MailChimp because I think it's a mm -hmm. wonderful value for the price that you pay or you don't pay if you're mm -hmm. on the free plan. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, yes, I've got a lot more to say. And I'm also writing an ebook on, awesome. on MailChimp. On MailChimp, yeah, just awesome. beyond the basics because I think everybody gets the basics very quickly on MailChimp. Mm -hmm. It's a very intuitive platform and mm -hmm. user interface. But I think there are some subtleties that, that kind of escape people. And so I'm, I'm working on that too. Yeah, nice. Um, I like the, the, the point you br brought up through the, the beginning there uh, and about um, not owning your list on the other platforms. It's, it, and I think it's, it, it's very similar to hosting your website through Tumblr or through Wix or uh, what, Squarespace, I think is one of them. Um, the, these free platforms where you can create a, a website, for, you know, that's pretty easy and, and probably free. Uh, th that's referred to as digital sharecropping. You don't own the land, you're just farming it and they can take it away at any time either because they shut down or their terms of service change or they, the, you know these, these groups can make these companies can make any changes to their service that they want and you can be left completely in the cold either without a website or without access to, to your people I think it's really important yeah to to have to have your own list and to pay for your own domain domain and pay for your web hosting it's a couple of dollars a month and you're, it's, it can be. It can be more. <laughs> it can be more. It can be more. Like I, I think it doesn't um, have to, but it can be more. Yeah. 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 Um, I forget what I. I think I'm like eight dollars a month for hosting, um, maybe eleven or twelve. Um, but it's worth it. it. You know, it's worth for that that small amount, and I can do a lot with it, and I don't have to worry about. You know, a, a, if if my web host shuts down, I. They're going to let me know and I can move to another one and I don't, I'm, I don't have any problems. Um, whereas if I'm relying entirely on Twitter and then suddenly Twitter decides to charge for access or Facebook, you know, I'm screwed. I've, yep. I've lost access. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. I mean, I, I realize also that people are not comfortable just with the, with the idea of setting a domain and, you know, mm -hmm. managing their, their, uh, their server and everything. and, and yeah, there's a learning curve, and, and depending on what you run, it can be it can be complex. But um, but you're more in control of what you're doing. You know, it's mm -hmm. the difference between having a, a self-hosted WordPress versus the WordPress that you know you mm -hmm. just have on their server. There are things that you cannot do un unless you are self-hosted. Yeah. So that's a, that's a broader conversation, but I, I agree with your point. Also, it's 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 similar. You know, if if you really want to have control over your presence, try to own as much as possible. So mm -hmm. an email list is an example, but your site and your domain and your server is also another one. Yeah. Yeah, and and it's for if you're not, I think if you're not comfortable, you know, getting doing the 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 domain and the hosting. Um, you can you can have someone help you with that. There are a lot of people who like I I've walked a lot of people through that process. Um, I it's part of what I do as a, a web designer on the side, and you know they they can people can get things up and running for you for for not a lot of money. They're probably going to want to be paid for for <laughs> that, and you should want to pay them for that. Um, but yeah, I think the the the, se the security of that is is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and and yeah, there, there there's a real real intimacy with the inbox. <laughs> yes, there is, <laughs> there is, and we have ways to you know rely on personalization and mm -hmm. and it might sound kind of you know quirky and weird, but um but it's true that dropping a first name when you have it when you know it mm -hmm. makes a difference. Yeah, it really does make a difference. And um, I know that you know some of some people on my list I don't have. A first name information and mm -hmm. have ways to collect that um, through um, what we call progressive profiling. It's a it's a terrible word, but it's true. Um, but I, but it all, I know that it always makes me feel better when I when I'm able to drop a first name in an email. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's that's really part of the idea. Yeah. Um... What were the challenges that people were facing? You said that you were talking uh, to previous hosts about email marketing. I'm just curious about the challenges that they were facing. Um, 
Well, I think uh, I know. I know that of the the, the three podcasters, uh, of the three of us, um, one is very comfortable with uh, with emailing people, and he has a, a format, and it works very well. Uh, I'm sort of in the intermediate of the three of us on the the intermediate one. I I enjoy it. I I think I'm pretty good at it. I but except I don't do it enough. I think keep keeping keeping a regular schedule is a difficult thing with email, depending on um, what you're emailing about mm. and uh, you know like what what who your list is is aimed at. And the, the the third one, he he didn't know what an autoresponder series was, and I'm sure a lot of people here won't know what that is. Mm-hmm. Uh, essentially, for people who 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 don't know, an autoresponder series is a series of e- automated emails that go out to your list. Uh, typically when they sign up. So um, for, for the music publishing podcast, I still have to write my, my series of, of three emails to introduce who am, one, who am I is the first email. The second email is what is the podcast? And three is how can you get in, involved and engaged? Um, and yeah, I, th- I, I, don't, I think that that might be a thing that do you, do you, uh, push people that you consult with or not push would you recommend that they they set up a series like that um yes um i think i mean it depends on what you have to offer Mm -hmm. but if you have a broad set of offerings then yeah i would definitely do that and um i like the way also you 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 cut it you know it's just like who am i what am i doing and how can we connect how can we Mm -hmm. you know engage so that's 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 a great way to do it but um for an artist, it might be, you know, the first one could be a thank you and, and offering something right off the bat. You know, thank you so much for signing up. This yes. is, you know, this is an MP3, you know, that's that's some free music from you. Mm-hmm. Um, and the second one could be concerts, you know, like I'm a composer, but I'm also a performer and I perform my music and here is the schedule of concerts. I'd love to see you there, blah, blah, blah. You know, so there are, there are depending on what you're offering, there are ways to do that. But mm-hmm. um, we have a five email um, automation list. Um, automation series on I care if you listen and I see some incredible engagement on that nice. you know the the first one is sent almost instantly mm-hmm. I mean te- you know it's sent instantly you, you sign up like within the next two seconds you have an email in your inbox to thank yes. you and also share the link to the mixtape mm-hmm. which was one of our offers so so anyway yes and that that works really well that works really well and of course you know you can schedule that at different time intervals you don't have mm-hmm. to send them like every day you can say one day, three days, five days, seven days, you know, 15 mm-hmm. and, you know, maybe 31 days or something like that. So you can really spread them out and see how they work. But um, it's a great way to introduce people, you know, uh, to, to what you're doing, who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, that, that works really well. The, 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 the problem is if you don't have something like that and say you have a monthly newsletter, mm-hmm. if people sign up the day after you sent it, which is the worst case scenario for you, they won't hear from you for like 30 days. Mm-hmm. You know, and the problem that we see is that if you send emails less than three, less than three weeks apart, so you know more than three weeks apart, people might forget that have, that it's signed up, mm-hmm. and they're going to unsubscribe and maybe mark you as spam, which mm-hmm. is really unfair because they yeah. signed up in the first place. You know, yeah. but this is something that I've seen. I would have seen a lot from people with AOL.com addresses, but I won't say that publicly. Mm, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but um, but that, that's something that you see, you know, as people sign up, like they forgot about that and they just they just mark you as spam, which in return hurts your sender um, mm. <clears throat> your sender reputation, which yeah. is very important to cut through uh, spam folders. Mm-hmm. So uh, so series can help you do that. You know, you might have a newsletter every three weeks, every two weeks. But the moment people sign up, you start a conversation and you don't start with, uh, buy these, do that, do yeah. that, you know, it's just like, no, no, thank you so much, you know, we're starting this relationship, we're going to take it slow and this is what it's about. So, yeah, it's it's a great way to start something. Yeah. Um, one thing that uh, I, I find a lot in the, uh, in the book world is to entice people to join your list, you offer the first book in a series or, or one, one of your books for, you know, if you sign up, this is what you get. I, I think that's a really strong way to to get people to to engage with what it is that you do. You know, if you have some recordings, uh, then uh, you know, say, oh, you'll get this 
a recording of this piece or, or, or something to or or I think it's not a great idea to send a score because you don't know who's who's signing up and you know if you're gonna send out a solo piano piece to a flute player that doesn't really work <laughs> they can't really engage with that you can send to a, to a page where they can pick and choose this is true yeah the, yeah you there know, there are lots um, of options uh, if if you want to entice people into your list or um you can also send an email with multiple links to different pieces mm -hmm. and then segment by what piece people clicked on. Mm -hmm. So that's also self-identification, you know, like, oh, you clicked on flute. Okay, you're interested in flute stuff. You're going to get my flute, my flute stuff next, you know. So that's something you can do with email marketing. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, what are some of the, 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 I mean, you've already said a, a little bit of it, but what are some of the other best practices for sending out emails? Like should you should um, like should your first line in the email be um, hi everybody sorry for the email blast or the sorry for the mass email mass email but blah 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 is that how you should start your your emails to everybody? No, I wouldn't say so. Like, <laughs> I see that so much, and I'm like, stop. it's just like people who say, "Well, I'm not racist, but oh, let's stop." You yeah. know, like that's, <laughs> that's it. That's it. There is no sentence following this. It's over. You know. Yeah. So same same stuff. Except if you're apologizing for the email blast, you shouldn't send an email blast in the first mm -hmm. place. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the, I think one of the best practices is, well, there are there are many, but uh, you know, scheduling. We talked about scheduling, making sure that. Sh so look at your offers. What mm -hmm. do I have to offer to a potential audience? What's in it for them, really? Why should they? Why should they follow me? Why should they subscribe to my newsletter? Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have this set of offering and you know exactly where to send that, where, where to push that. This is more of a social thing. This mm -hmm. is more of an email marketing thing. Anyway, so when you have your list of offers, then you, you can know if this is sustainable or not. You know, if you're going to say, I'm going to send an acoustic version, you know, an acoustic cover to my followers every week. Can you sustain that? Mm. Can you really do that? You know, <laughs> so that that's that's a good question, and then and then you'll find the answer. It'll be like, okay, I can offer this on a consistent basis every two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good model. Let's start with that, and maybe it's going to be uh, more often, less often. Mm -hmm. It's totally fine. Um, also, thinking about segments very early on is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, if you have different offers and they don't necessarily overlap. It might be a good idea to to create segments and create a way for people to either self-identify or for you to segment the list in those different things. Mm -hmm. Let's say, um, like a geo uh, location is a good way to segment stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm working with uh, with a songwriter who tours Europe extensively. He spends about six months a year touring Europe. Lives in the U.S. And um, so what I'm putting in place with him is basically a segmentation system by country, you know, mm -hmm. why would you tell your um, German audience that you're touring in Portugal? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, chances are maybe, you know, one or two German people will be on vacation and will be happy to see that. Mm -hmm. But uh, but maybe that's something you can say on social, you know, where, where it's mm -hmm. really broader and people might pick that on social and be there. But, um, mm -hmm. but that's something that I'm trying to push, you know, like you're going to send more relevant stuff to less people and it's totally mm -hmm. fine. That's the goal of segmenting your list. Um, Another piece of advice is whenever you know that you're going to send an email, the first thing you should do is really think about what's going to be in it and how you can express that in your email, in your subject line. Okay. Mm -hmm. The you can have the most beautiful email, engaging photos, you know, calls to action everywhere. Like, you know, okay, it's cool. But if your subject line is Jane Doe July newsletter, mm -hmm. People might not click on that, you know. Yeah. It's just, and and it's a shame because because all the work you're going to be doing or you have done, if you write your subject line after after your work, this just goes, you know, just goes away for nothing. You know, you, ha yeah. you have lost everything. So really think about your subject lines. Keep them short. Keep them snappy. A subject line is a promise. Okay, I mm -hmm. promise you that if you click, you're gonna get this. Okay, mm -hmm. so really fulfill that promise. You know, don't don't mess with that because you're really gonna hurt your confidence. And email marketing is really about confidence. Mm -hmm. So so think about your subject lines first and and write them and write five, six, ten and pick the best. You know, mm -hmm. uh, insert some personalization if you can. Hey, comma Jane, exclamation mark. You know. This is what what's inside, you know. That's mm -hmm. just a, that's just a lame example, but stuff like that. Um, 
There is also in email marketing something we call the pre-header, meaning that if you don't set this up, um, so for instance, if you look at on Gmail or on, on your mobile device, mm -hmm. when you receive an email, you have the subject line, the mm -hmm. sender, the subject line, and then you have kind of a preview of what's inside, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Years ago, when people were not setting pre-headers, we used to see like code. Sometimes it was just like straight up code and CSS mm -hmm. or HTML, or the first few words of the email, mm -hmm. which might not work really well. It cannot end up being like, "Hey, sorry for the email blast," you know, yeah. right before you open it. That's the mm -hmm. first thing you see. So that's what we call the pre-header, and most email marketing systems will support that and will let you write a piece of text to kind of accompany, like the companion piece to the subject line. And mm -hmm. the great thing about that is that. You don't have the same character limitations as the subject line. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be around maybe 50 to 70 character stops. And um, so you can write a lot more, and you can also play off that subject line. You know? mm -hmm. So if you introduce an element of like surprise or curiosity in the subject line, you can give another element of answer in the pre-header. You can have some personalization in the pre-header. Mm -hmm. And these are really strong elements that will, that will turn into a, a, an open, okay, which, we, mm -hmm. which is one of the two key metrics in email marketing. You have open and click-through rate. So, so that's the first thing. You know, people get, get, get into like, the, the design. I want to make sure that my, that my email is responsive and the buttons look like that. It's great. But think about your um, subject line very early on, very, very early on in the process. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally, totally. I, uh, <laughs> um, for the longest time, I, I did the Dennis Tabensky November newsletter. And I had pretty decent open rates. Um, and, and then just in the past year, I've changed things up um, and, and started being more descriptive of, of what's inside and, and being more personal in, in the subject line. And oh, wow, it, it exploded. Like people are, are opening it and their you know, click through rates are, are still not great, um, but I think they're, they're kind of low for composers in general. But I get responses. I get people write back. And you know, then, then there's that engagement. There's the there's the back and forth. There's the conversation. It's you know, oh, this is wonderful, blah 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 blah. And then you can write back, and and it's you know, so great to hear from you. What have you been up to? I haven't heard from you in so long. And it becomes now a a, a conversation with the person yeah. rather than an email blast. Yeah, and and you, and you know that it's working when you see this happening. You know that it's working, and that's yeah. something that I mean, you can design your email that way too. You know. Mm -hmm. A lot of people see that as email blast. You know, it's a mm -hmm. one-way street. You know, you mm -hmm. get your your uh, your bullhorn and you just like yell stuff at people. Nobody's mm -hmm. going to answer to that, uh, or maybe they're going to answer by unsubscribing and mocking mm -hmm. you as spam, which would be yeah. bad. But uh, but definitely, you know, you can start a conversation on email. Mm -hmm. It's it's definitely possible. Yeah. So so you, you can build your emails that way. Um, yeah, and and you know, you you said something about click-through rates are low for composers. Something that I'd like to say also is don't don't look too much at industry industry rates. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. don't let people tell you your click through rate should be seven percent if it's less yeah. than that, or you know whatever. Yeah. So, what you should do though is is create your own baseline, mm -hmm. and you do something for six months or how many months, and then you're like, all right, now I've established the baseline. How can I increase that? And, mm -hmm. and just the way you did it, you're like, okay, I'm going to invest more time and energy into better subject lines. And then you mm -hmm. see if it works or if it doesn't. And in mm -hmm. your case, it did. Yeah. You realize that the click-through rate didn't follow, but the open rate, which is the first win, the first battle, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that was better. So now you can focus on your content and try to figure out why why doesn't my content work better. You know, the mm -hmm. click-through rate will show the, the engagement on your content. The subject line shows your, is reflected, you know, the su success of the subject line is reflected in the open rate. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, another thing that I, I, I changed around the same time um, was to, to start adding a little featurette at the end of my, my, my you know, emails go out in it's three parts. The top is very brief. This is what's coming up or this is what happened recently, just kind of bullet points of, uh, of events. Then one or two, maybe three very brief descriptions, very personal, uh, you know, written very informally of, you know, these are major things that have happened or, or that are happening, like, I'll be writing an opera soon, and that's exciting, or I just got married, and that's exciting. And at the very end, I, I have a little featurette called uh, 
what am I listening to? Where I feature another composer. I feature someone else's music. And I pick one piece and I say, I really like this and I think you'll like it too. And click throughs on that are great. And correspondingly, everything else in the email, people are, are clicking there because mm. I've started talking about other people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because I, it, it, it's sort of similar to the, the social ratio. Networking. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's uh, you know, if you're not always talking about yourself, you can actually engage people a lot more and mm -hmm. I, people like randomly will bring up, they'll say, Oh, I love your emails. And like they're, it's the whole, oh. <laughs> your, your email is the only, <laughs> that'll be great for the editing. Um, uh, yours is the only one of the, one of the few emails I actually read because I know you're going to talk about something really cool. And also there is, there's a risk with newsletter, you know, like, um, I think people see that as, as a kitchen sink, like me, let me put mm -hmm. everything in there, you know, mm -hmm. and they just send you like a website, the equivalent of a website. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that really works. Yeah. Um, because in terms of, you know, click, click to attention ratio, like stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know, how many, how many click opportunities are there in your, in your email? Mm -hmm. Um, something that I like to, to keep in mind and, um, I like to think of a click budget mm -hmm. in an email campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, if you give yourself two clicks, mm -hmm. maybe three if you're very generous, okay? So you give your audience two clicks mm -hmm. and you look at your email and you say, all right, my email is done or my email is sketched. Let's say you mm -hmm. haven't built it yet. What are the two most important links that I want people to click on? Mm -hmm. And how many clicks do I have? You know, and if you realize that you have 12 clicks mm -hmm. and you have a budget of two, mm -hmm. you're going to ask your readers to make a lot of decisions and pick wisely. OK, mm -hmm. if you limit your options, then you get a better ratio there. Mm -hmm. You're like, OK, uh, this is really important to me. This is not that important. I don't want people to waste a click on that. So let me, you know, let me just remove that. And so I, I think by, by looking at it this way and, and scrolling is free. So that's my two laws, mm -hmm. you know, scrolling is free and then you have a click budget. Um, if you look at if you look at it this way, you're going to make some some good decisions in terms of content. You know, this is not essential. You know, this is this is the news that I'd like to share, but maybe I won't share it on on email. Maybe I'll share it on social or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and also keep in mind the inverted pyramid. Whatever is really important to you, what's really important, um, what you really want people to to do, should be at the top. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, so it's, it, you know. Maybe you can skip the the intro paragraph where you tell people about you know what's going on in your life or stuff like that mm -hmm. or the intro like all oh, the sorry for the email blast yeah. you know this is what's going on in my life well yeah it's a newsletter I expect that's mm -hmm. what I'm getting you know you can skip that and and lead me straight to the best content that you have to offer so um, so these are considerations that I try to to make people aware of and um, and and that I that I see working you know personally and professionally mm -hmm. uh, with clients or or at, at work you know like. If you keep your emails very focused with possibly a single call to action, mm -hmm. when there is only one thing to do in an email, there, there are more chances that people will do it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's less. You're not dividing their attention. You know, it's like this is the most important thing I want you to do, and it's up top, mm -hmm. and that's the only thing you can do. If you want to click on it, you're going to click on it. If you don't want, you just trash the email. But um, you're not giving them 25 other links mm -hmm. that might not be as relevant or as important to you. Mm -hmm. So. It's a it's it's a different kind of design philosophy, you know, and uh, and you know the terms like newsletter and email blast kind of pull you the other way, where you want to provide a lot and put a lot, mm -hmm. but it, it it just ends up being overwhelming yeah. for for readers. So anyway, nice. That, that, I, <laughs> as you're talking, I'm like already reworking the way that I do things. <laughs> like that, that's fantastic. Uh, well, since we're we're about the, the hour fifteen mark, um, is there any before we we go into final bits? Is there anything else you want to add on email marketing? Um, there is so much I would like to add on email marketing, <laughs> <laughs> but that's why I'm writing an ebook about Mailchimp. Yeah. But uh, no, I mean it's just it's a very important channel very, very important channel. Mm -hmm. And you have to respect your 
readers and you have to provide value to your readers don't say mm -hmm. the same thing to everybody try to segment as much as possible mm -hmm. segmenting is based on value and offers and mm -hmm. think about this very very early on and maybe make it available in your form you know and mm -hmm. and we could talk about you know for a long time about sign sign up forms also but um, mm -hmm. if you if you're mostly talking about cooking and concerts maybe you can offer that in the sign up form maybe people say well i'm mostly interested in concert not really about what you're cooking and you mm -hmm. check that box and then you don't send the same thing to people who have checked that box so mm -hmm. so these are these are considerations and um but if if you if you think about this early on and really respect your audience on email it's a very very powerful channel mm -hmm. very powerful i mean if you look at your google analytics on your website and you look at your different channels and incoming traffic traffic from those channels and look at the quality and we could talk about the quality of traffic and what it means but if you look at maybe the number of pages and the, the, mm -hmm. the duration on site which could be good metrics for that engagement in my experience the traffic that comes from email is much better mm -hmm. people stay longer people look at more pages so you have an in-depth more engaged visit coming from email than say Facebook so so you know Maybe it's not true for you. Just look at your stats, you know, make rules for yourself. But in my personal experience, working on multiple sites, traffic from email marketing is really good. So you really want to, you know, this is this should be like you should spend a lot of time thinking about this and really mm -hmm. crafting your emails in, in, in a great way. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um I, I think we may have to like have you back to talk about some more of more of these things because let's do I, it I, I i can i can keep going for like five hours but uh <laughs> <laughs> but, let's, but let's maybe break it up um so uh where can oh by the way i'm gonna definitely make um i'm gonna try to find that uh link to astrid's um article on i care if you listen smart goals yeah yeah i'm gonna try to to put that in the show notes um, so everybody can find that on the, mm -hmm. the website. Uh, I've got a couple other things I'm going to add in, in for, for the links. Um, but where can, uh, where can we, where can we find you online and what do you have coming up that we should know about and, and think about? Okay. Um, so the blog itself is at iqfilisten.com. We also have a .tv site. You know, if people have videos they want to submit, so it's basically a YouTube for new music, only new music videos. That's that's fun. Mm -hmm. um, on the personal side of things, you can find me on Twitter. I'm on Twitter a lot. Uh, my uh, handle is tdnvl, Tango, Tango Delta November Victor Lima, something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, and my website is thomasdenevil.com. Um, I haven't haven't been blogging for a while because my professional life has been busy, mm. so I might have to start blogging about my professional life, mm -hmm. and my nine to five, uh, because I do fun stuff and interesting stuff. So I might start to blog about that, so I'll have something interesting to say. And most of what I do during my nine to five life also applies to uh, to what I'm trying to do outside with consulting with artists and helping them with their presence and email marketing and stuff like that. So yeah, find me on Twitter. Look at my website. Um, you'll probably be prompted to subscribe to my newsletter, mm -hmm. uh, which is segmented, and I try to share good stuff with people and really start a conversation and help people. And you know, um, I love I love challenges. I love um, marketing and communications challenges for artists. So please hit me up on Twitter, you know, and tell me I'm trying to do this and it's it's not working. And uh, if I can help you in a few tweets or, you know, switch to DM and help you out and point out a tool or show what's working or what's not working. I'd love to do that, you know, and if it means that we need to work more together, then mm -hmm. maybe we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. But um, if it's just, if I can help with a couple of tweets or a quick phone call, like I would love to do that. Hit me up. Nice. nice. And you said you have uh, a residency coming up and... and I... Yeah, yeah. So last November I was at Juilliard for a residency on entrepreneurship and um, we're talking about another one in the fall. Uh, so I'll be in New York City in the fall and I'm going to try to be in touch with other schools because mm -hmm. um, I think that that's that's something that is not yet part of the curriculum in a lot of schools mm -hmm. uh, you know this this entrepreneurship and social presence and stuff like that so um, um, if you're in the city and you would like me to come and talk um, at your school or organize a workshop about websites and social same stuff, you know, uh, reach out to me on Twitter and uh, on my website, send me an email and uh, we can talk about that. But um, that's something that I've really 
been enjoying, you know, talking and, and, and helping students. And um, I, I like it because it's it's really rewarding and, and, you know, they have some great ideas, but also, as we were saying in email marketing, like the earlier you start, the better it is, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, it, it feels really good to tell like a student, you, you might not have much to say right now, but mm -hmm. start building your list because the moment you'll have something to say, and people will listen. You'll have an audience, you know, of uh, people that are engaged with what you're trying to say. So, uh, so anyway, I like doing that. So the Julian residency will be for Julia students and possibly alums. Uh, but um, I'll be in the city. So if you want to meet one on one, we can also meet in the city. Awesome, awesome. We, yep. <laughs> we're gonna have to get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, stick around. We'll go back to the green room in a second. Um, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, if you uh, would like to follow Music Publishing Podcast on, on Twitter or, or like the Facebook page, that's where I let people know when these live events happen. You can, you know, ask questions. We haven't had any questions today. Um, you can ask questions, you know, make comments, you know, interact with us while, while we're doing stuff live. So that's where you'll find out where, when those happen. And uh, on the Music Publishing Podcast website, you can sign up for the mailing list and uh, start sending out some stuff that you're, you're not gonna get just through the, through the website and through the, your, your iTunes subscription. So uh, check that out. And uh, again, thank you all for listening and I will see you next time. Bye.